Tuesday the 2nd of April 2013, Akron, Ohio. At approximately 8 a.m. in the morning, contractors arrived at a family home in New Franklin Township to continue work on a family's home renovations. At about 1.30 p.m., one of those workers went upstairs to use the bathroom. It was as he walked to the bathroom that he noticed something odd about the marital bedroom in the house. Curiosity got the better of him as he gently pushed open the door to the bedroom, only to be confronted with a scene from his deepest nightmares. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Margaret Jane Kerr was born on the 29th of November 1953 in Akron, Summit County, Ohio, the United States, to parents Margaret Kerr and Robert Kerr. She had four siblings, completing her family of seven, and spent her entire childhood living in the Akron area. Margaret, known as Peg to her friends and family, attended Garfield High School, from which she graduated before going on to attend the University of Akron. At the age of 19, Peg married her high school sweetheart, a man by the name of Larry Brown, on the 10th of March 1973, becoming Margaret Jane Brown. Though the marriage between Peg and Larry wasn't destined to last, with the couple filing for divorce four years later in 1977. While Peg had been at the University of Akron in 1983, she actually founded her own business called Technical Resource Services, which is where she began networking and connecting with colleagues in the legal community. Peg's strong drive not only translated itself through her adulthood, but had also presented itself when she had been in high school. She had pushed to become the first female to be allowed to take auto mechanics at Garfield High School, challenging the system until it could be permitted. Further testament to her character, during her time at Garfield High School, she brought the first live ram to the Rubber Bowl as the mascot for the Garfield High Golden Rams football team. Though, she got rear-ended on the way, causing the ram to escape from the car and run down the street with Peg chasing after it. Whilst running her business and whilst still attending the University of Akron, Peg met a man called Jeffrey Schobert, and the pair quickly hit it off. Jeffrey Earl Schobert was known as Jeff to his friends and family, and he was born on the 13th of July in 1956, also in Akron, Summit County, Ohio. Shout out to my people who were born on the 13th of July. That's also my birthday, so shout out Jeff. Jeff spent his childhood, just like most boys of the time, playing sports, reading comics, and cheering for his favorite team. He was known from an early age for his intelligence and strong work ethic, which came to fruition when, at the age of 16, he started his own lawn care business called Quality Lawn Care. Jeff graduated from Firestone High School in 1974. According to his family, he had reluctantly been on the swim team at high school after numerous unsuccessful attempts to make the basketball team. Outstandingly, Jeff's academic success at school and his success in business saw him receive an acceptance letter to Harvard University, though Jeff decided to stay local and attend the University of Akron, where he stayed before transferring to finish his undergraduate degree at the Ohio State University in 1982. Jeff ultimately obtained his Juris Doctorate from the University of Akron, where he graduated with honors in 1986. Now, it was while Jeff had been at the University of Akron that he had first met Peg, and it wasn't long before the couple tired the knot. On the 30th of August, 1986, Peg and Jeff eloped, with Peg becoming Margaret Jane Schobert. The couple eventually welcomed two children into the world, Jessica and Chelsea. Peg would find work at the firm of Hannah, Campbell and Powell, with Jeff's strong work ethic leading him to become one of Ohio's most predominant lawyers. 
Since 1987, the year after his graduation from university, Jeff represented physicians, hospitals, and other healthcare providers throughout the state of Ohio, even arguing several cases before the Ohio Supreme Court in cases pertaining to medical malpractice. According to our sources, in honor of his accolades in the courtroom, Jeff was elected to the American Board of Trial Advocates as an associate member in January of 2003. He was further named one of Ohio's super lawyers from 2005 to 2011. To top all of that off, he was named one of the best lawyers in America since 2006. Every year since then, he was named one of the best lawyers in America. Jeff wasn't just successful in his career, he was also successful in his charitable efforts. He dedicated his time and resources to aiding local groups and organizations. Jeff was a former board member of the Akron Rotary Club, which was, quote, a camp for children with special needs. Peg also volunteered her time for the Akron Rotary Camp alongside her husband. Jeff further provided scholarships to children who couldn't afford to attend the Akron Rotary Club. Moreover, he shared his legal experience and knowledge with students at Archbishop Hoban High School by serving as a coach for one of its mock trial teams, also being a former member for Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Peg, too, was heavily involved in volunteering at Archbishop Hoban High School for the mock trial program. She was also the co-chair of annual Extravaganza, was involved in the Junior League, alongside many other local charities. Peg sponsored children in Africa and dedicated her life tirelessly to volunteering and serving others. She was a lover of boating, jet skiing, and riding snowmobiles. The family of four seemed to live the perfect life, everything going amazingly. Though on the 2nd of April 2013, the dream they were living shattered into a living nightmare. At approximately 8 a.m. in the morning, contractors arrived at the Schobert family home at 4488 Rex Lake Drive, New Franklin Township, to continue work on the family's home renovations. It's important to note that the contractors worked on the ground floor of the property, not going to the upper floor at any point. That was until about 1.30 p.m. when Nick Gehring arrived at the Schobert family home to check on the progress of his crew working at the house. After checking in with his crew, Nick decided to go upstairs to use the bathroom. And it was when he did that that he noticed something strange in the Schobert's marital bedroom. Nick walked into the marital bedroom and was confronted with a scene of horror. 56-year-old Jeffrey Schobert and 59-year-old Margaret Schobert dead. Both Jeff and Peg had been struck multiple times with a sledgehammer that was also located in the bedroom, resulting in both Jeff and Peg dying of blunt force trauma. Further, Jeff had sustained several stab wounds. Nick immediately contacted the authorities. A New Franklin police officer responded to the call, securing the scene to minimize any accidental destruction of forensic evidence. This police officer noted Jeffrey's body being on the bed, with Peg's body located on the floor next to it. He further noted the multiple massive head wounds that both had sustained, and a sledgehammer that had been lying on the bed next to Jeff. And interestingly, this officer took note of the fact that Jeff's car had been missing from the driveway of the house. Detective Hitchings from the New Franklin Township Police Department was one of the first to respond to the family home, arriving at about 2.30 p.m., and he became the lead investigator on this case. As the New Franklin Township Police Department had been a somewhat small operation, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation was contacted and requested to assist with the analysis of the crime scene, and they dispatched a man called George Staley to the property. George Staley processed the crime scene, finding reddish stains, which later tested positive in a presumptive blood test in the ground level of the house, near the doorway leading to the room between the kitchen and the garage of the property. George Staley further collected a knife that had been lying on the living room chair alongside a piece of what appeared to him to have been part of a surgical glove that also had a reddish stain on it. 
More reddish stains were found on pieces of paper that George Daly found inside Peg's purse, which had been located on the dining room table. Investigators determined there to have been blood splatter on the ceiling of the master bedroom, the room in which Peg and Jeff's bodies had been found, and blood splatter on the dresser located close to the bed. The sledgehammer found on the bed and a small piece of plastic also found on the bed were taken into evidence. Inside the family home, it was established that several of Peg's jewellery had been taken, though it was clear to the detectives that robbery hadn't been the true motive for the double murder, as several items of value had been left inside the home. From the outset of the investigation, Detective Michael Hitchings, the lead investigator, became aware of an incident that had occurred to the murdered couple's youngest daughter, Chelsea. As it turns out, Chelsea had been attacked and had ended up in the hospital and Chelsea's parents had forbidden someone from seeing her in the hospital, a man by the name of Sean Ford. Sean Ford Jr. had been born on the 30th of September 1994 in Minnesota, and had been the second of what ultimately would be three children born to his parents Kelly Ford and Sean Ford Sr. Tragically, Sean's younger sister Shante passed away when she had been just three years old and Shantae's passing had a detrimental effect on the family, understandably. Sean didn't speak for months after the death of his younger sister, processing his grief at such a young age, and sadly his parents began to fight often, with the fights being both verbal and getting physical. This fighting had a serious effect on the young Sean, fighting that involved knives and saw Sean's mum having to go into hospital multiple times. According to court records, at a young age, Sean tried to intervene and protect his mother, crawling on his father's back and begging him to, quote, stop beating my mum. Sadly, the violence and fighting between Sean's parents only escalated. This saw Sean's mum Kelly leaving his father, though Kelly was unable to look after Sean and his sister, and so she sent her children to Chicago to go live with their grandparents. Sean had been five years old when he had moved in with his grandparents in Chicago, and his grandparents ensured to provide a loving family home where discipline and structure were present to create the best environment for Sean and his sister to grow up in. Unfortunately, Sean had trouble in school, even at such a young age, being teased and bullied on account of what court records describe to be his high-pitched voice. Sean's stint living with his grandparents only lasted a few years, with his mother Kelly deciding that she wanted her children to come back to her and live with her again. When the time came for Sean to say goodbye to his grandparents to go live with his mother in Akron, he found it extremely difficult. And after moving to Akron to be with his mother, who, by the way, his mother had worked very, very hard to make sure that they had a place, a roof over their head, and the right resources and financials to be able to support her children. But once uh, once he'd shown and moved back in with his mother, he had little to no contact with his grandparents, as they didn't know how to get in touch with Sean or his mother due to there being no stable address or phone number for them. Sean's mother had entered a relationship with a man called Tracy Wooden, and when Sean and his sister returned to Akron, he lived with his mother and Tracy. It's interesting to note that at the age of seven, Sean didn't say anything at all for six to seven months. And when Sean did speak, he would ask for his biological father, a father figure that was never around, despite his father promising Sean and his sister that he would come see them. Sean's troubles at school didn't alleviate with his move from Chicago to Akron, with him still experiencing bullying at the hands of his classmates. And at home, his mother would, quote, whoop him and discipline him with a belt. Though no matter how hard Sean was hit, he would never cry. As Sean grew older, his mother would change her disciplinary techniques to making him stand with a 25-pound weight above his head. And sadly, as he had seen with his biological parents, Sean would also witness physical and verbal abuse of his mother from Tracy Wooden. This fighting would also extend to physical altercations between Sean and Tracy Wooden as Sean grew up. Ultimately, though, Tracy Wooden was arrested and sentenced to one year imprisonment for selling drugs. After Tracy had served his stint behind bars, according to court records, Sean was, quote, running the streets and, quote, got wild. Sean's teenage years weren't without criminality, 
as a juvenile, he was arrested, which saw Tracy Wooden posting his bond. And Tracy Wooden would get upset with Sean if he didn't go to his probation officer's meetings. It was at around this same time, in August or September of 2012, that Sean met a girl called Chelsea Schobert, the youngest daughter of Jeff and Peg Schobert. The pair had met on Facebook and soon began dating. Chelsea Schobert was Sean's first, quote, real girlfriend, and the relationship became serious quickly, with them seeing one another daily. As we've discussed, Chelsea's background was one of prominence and wealth, though her family wouldn't hesitate to include Sean and his stepbrother in family meals or going on holidays or just general get-togethers. At one point, Tracy Wooden saw Chelsea give Sean and his brother money and gifts, and he thought that Sean should give him some of this money too, that he was under that impression that he should receive some of this money that he was given. On the week commencing the 12th of March 2013, Detective Bertina King was called out to the home where Sean lived with his mother and Tracy Wooden, along with Tracy's children and his uncle, who had Alzheimer's. The visit had been due to a report that Tracy Wooden had attacked Sean, resulting in a physical altercation bad enough that the police were called. Tracy Wooden had allegedly hit Sean with a baseball bat before biting him hard, which saw Sean having to go to the hospital for treatment. In the filed report about the incident, Detective King described the conditions of the house as deplorable and of how she couldn't even enter the property due to the stench emanating from it. Following this incident, Sean moved out of the home and went to stay with his friend Josh Greathouse. On the 21st of March 2013, Chelsea Schobert celebrated her 18th birthday with her family. She decided that she wanted to celebrate her birthday further with her friends on the Friday of that same week, on March 22nd. And so, in the evening of Friday the 22nd of March 2013, Chelsea and Sean travelled to their friend's house, who was called Zach Keys. Joshua Greathouse, the friend who Sean had been staying with after moving out of the family home, also attended the gathering at Zach's house. At around 11pm that evening, the group of four began drinking heavily, quickly becoming intoxicated. Now, there's a few conflicting reports about whether drug use was present at this gathering, with Chelsea denying any use of marijuana, and Zach Keyes stating that they had all become very drunk and high, and that they had smoked marijuana. The conflict of information was such that Zach, Chelsea, and Josh all provided conflicting accounts as to what happened in the property that evening while they were celebrating Chelsea's birthday. Zach would later testify that at some point that evening, Chelsea and Sean went into his mother's bedroom, and approximately 10 to 15 minutes later, he heard a loud thud coming from within the bedroom. Upon hearing this thud, Zach got up to go see what was happening, which was when he saw Chelsea half off the bed with a gash in her head. Sean had left the bedroom before coming back with a knife. Zach went on to testify that he had been the one who had said that Chelsea needed to go to the hospital, and that it was him and Sean that had carried Chelsea out to the car and driven her to the hospital. However, Josh Greathouse claims that he, Josh, had stayed on the couch and that he could see Chelsea on the floor next to the bed and not lying off the bed like Zach had stated. Josh went on to state that when Sean walked out, he, quote, disappeared for a few minutes before going going back into the bedroom and hitting Chelsea on the head. Josh testified that he had stayed on the couch the entire time and never went to help, only watching Zach pull Sean off Chelsea. According to Chelsea's accounts, after she and Sean had gone into the bedroom, Sean stated that he wanted to have sex with her, though Chelsea told him that she wasn't feeling well and asked him to wait. This resulted in Sean pushing Chelsea onto the bed. Chelsea firmly said no to Sean before getting up and saying, quote, I hate you. It was in retaliation to this that Sean hit Chelsea in the head. Sean had hit Chelsea with a brick, which would later be found blooded on the floor nearby. That was when Zach had entered the room and asked Sean, what the hell is going on here? Sean then left the bedroom and returned with a knife before proceeding to stab Chelsea in the neck and back. Zach quickly intervened and stopped Sean from stabbing Chelsea again, and, as he stated in his own testimony, he had been the one to suggest that Chelsea needed to go to the hospital. Of course she needed to go to the hospital, she'd just been stabbed and hit in the head with a brick. Take her to the hospital. As a result of this attack, Chelsea suffered a spinal injury with long-term lasting effects. At the hospital, Zach, Josh, and Sean all provided a report to the police that detailed of how Chelsea had been involved in a drug deal gone wrong in Kent, Ohio. 
All three men were shown a photo lineup, and all three of them picked out an individual as the person responsible for attacking Chelsea. Notably, the person they picked out was not Sean Ford. Now, what's interesting is that Chelsea's parents, Peg and Jeff Schobert, had actually placed a GPS tracking device on Chelsea's car as she had begun to break her curfew and had started getting into trouble. The data taken from this GPS device showed that Chelsea had not been in Kent on the evening of the 23rd of March 2013, as the three men had stated, but rather at Zach's residence. On Saturday the 24th of March 2013, Sean spoke to Zach and told him to tell the police that Chelsea had been assaulted by some guys at a party in Kent. He also told Joshua, quote, I want to make sure that you don't talk about this. When Chelsea was initially spoken to by detectives, she had told them that she did not remember who her attacker had been. Chelsea had to stay in the hospital due to her injuries, and due to the suspicions raised and questionable nature of how she'd been injured, her parents decided to not allow her to have contact with anyone while she was in the hospital. Both her parents stayed with her at the hospital by her side, taking it in turns to ensure she was never alone. On Monday the 25th of March 2013, the detectives looking into the assault of Chelsea conducted a recorded interview with Sean Ford. And in this interview, Sean told the detectives that Chelsea had indicated she had been attacked at a party in Kent. The authorities then told Sean about the GPS tracker and that it proved that she had not been in Kent that evening, to which Sean responded by saying that they had been at Zach's house when Chelsea was attacked. He went on to state that they were assaulted by someone Zach had owed money to and that this person hit Chelsea with a gun when she started cursing at him. As a result of Sean, Zach and Joshua and ultimately Chelsea identifying the same person from the photo array, on the 27th of March 2013, the police arrested a man called Ruse and charged him with assaulting Chelsea. Now Ruse categorically denied having any involvement in the assault and even provided a solid alibi. The detectives, throughout all of this, knew something wasn't right. They knew that they hadn't been told the truth. They knew that Ruse hadn't been involved. Now, it's important to note that the room that Chelsea had been admitted to in the hospital had been in a secured area of Akron Children's Hospital, and it didn't have a phone or any way to contact anyone outside of the ward. And even with the arrest of Ruse, her parents continued to deny Sean's request to visit Chelsea in the hospital. This denial of visitation was supported by the authorities, believing it to be the best way forward for Chelsea's safety. On the 1st of April 2013, at around 8 to 9 p.m., Jeff, Chelsea's father, kissed his youngest daughter goodnight before heading back to the family home, leaving his wife Peg to stay with Chelsea. On the following morning, at about 6 a.m. on the 2nd of April 2013, Peg also made her goodbyes to Chelsea before setting off back home. Unbeknownst to Chelsea and her parents, that would be the last time Chelsea would see her parents alive. And not a handful of hours later, both Jeff and Peg would be horrifically murdered. As we previously discussed, from the outset of the investigation into the murder of Jeff and Peg, the lead investigator, Detective Michael Hastings, was aware of the attack on Chelsea and that her parents had been preventing Sean Ford from seeing her in the hospital. And so that evening, on the 2nd of April 2013, Detective Hitchings went to question Sean Ford. It was at this questioning that Detective Hitchings broke the news to Sean that Chelsea's parents had been murdered. According to Detective Hitchings, Sean reacted to the news with what he described to have been, quote, a blank look. Sean then stated that he had not been involved and that he didn't know anything about the murders. That the detective had a keen eye and quickly noted some spots on the Air Jordan shoes that Sean had been wearing. And so Detective Hastings had the shoes taken into evidence. The detective then told Sean Ford that he was coming with him to the Portage County Jail, where he would be held on a warrant for lying to the authorities about Chelsea's assault. The following day, on the 3rd of April 2013, lead investigator Detective Hitchings learned that Sean had spoken with a fellow inmate at the jail called George Beach about the murders, and George Beach had passed on what he had said to the Portage County Sheriff. This information was what led the authorities to locating Jeffrey's car, which had been missing since the murders, and it was found on Stover Drive, Akron. Police searched around the area of the car and uncovered a pair of gloves, a knife, and a knit hat located inside the storm drain in front of a home on 869 Fried Street. 
Detective Hitchings decided to see whether the house that these items had been left in front of had been connected in some way to the double murder case. And so he spoke with a woman who lived at the address. And it was from that conversation that the detectives learned the woman was the mother of Maurice Phillips, one of Sean's friends. This connected the property to Sean and subsequently, potentially, to the murders. The woman allowed the police to conduct a search of the house and they located a man called Jamal Vaughn and his girlfriend in an upstairs bedroom. Further, they found a watch in the bedroom that Jamal and his girlfriend had been staying in on the bedroom floor, which was quickly identified to have belonged to the Schobert family. That same afternoon, lead investigator Detective Hitchings interviewed Sean Ford once more. Sean once again denied having any involvement in the murders, though Sean's story quickly began to unravel. He told detectives that he had walked halfway to the Schobert's family home with Zach and another friend called Malik, but they had turned back around. The detective then informed Sean that they had found the Schobert's and Chelsea's blood on his Air Jordan shoes. Sean quickly doubled down and claimed that he had actually loaned his shoes to Zach, and then later Zach gave him the shoes back. Sean then changed his story again, stating and admitting that he had been at the Schobert family home, quote, one time, and it was for the dad, but he had allegedly grown upset and left. His story changed again. Sean then confessed to Detective Hitchings that he had been there at the Schobert family home for part of the murders, but Sean claims that Zach and Malik, who this character called Malik, who and I'm not even sure as a real person, had been the ones who were who carried out the murders as they had the weapons. That same evening, lead detective Hitchings interviewed Jamal Vaughn, who had been in the house from which the Schobert's watch had been located. As a result of this interview, the authorities proceeded to recover cloth and latex gloves from a sewer drain on City View Avenue. On the 4th of April 2013, the authorities interviewed Sean Ford again. Detective Hitchings informed Sean that they had spoken with Jamal Vaughn and that they had discussed the evidence against Sean. According to court records, during this interview with Sean, the authorities informed him that this was a death penalty case that was to be presented to a grand jury soon, and Sean's cooperation could mean the difference between aggravated murder and the death penalty. The questioning went on for over an hour before Sean broke and told Detective Hitchings that it had been Jamal Vaughn's idea to do a, quote, lick of the Schoberts and that they had walked from Akron to the Schobert family home, which I believe is about nine miles. Sean put the full blame of the double homicide on Jamal Vaughn at first. Though, as the interview progressed, Sean eventually admitted that he was the only one who had used the sledgehammer on Jeffrey and Peg Schobert, and that it had been Jamal Vaughn who had stabbed Jeff in the back. Sean also confessed that they both stole Jeff's car. Sean Ford was subsequently charged with murder and was transported from the Portage County Jail to the Akron Jail. Once he had arrived at the Akron Jail, he was questioned again for over an hour by the detectives, with a line of questioning predominantly based on whether Zach Keyes had been present at the time of the murder, and Sean responded by saying that it had been just him and Jamal Vaughn involved in the double homicide. Now, it's interesting to note that each time Sean Ford was questioned by the authorities, he was read his Miranda rights, though he was allegedly not asked if he wanted to waive his rights, as the detective had told him, uh, that he was not required to. That fact comes up a lot a lot later on in the appeal. Um, I'm not sure whether we're actually going to retouch it, but just keep that in mind that there was a bit of protocol that wasn't followed to the T. Akron police subsequently executed a search warrant at 393 South Street in Akron, which had been the home of Josh Greathouse, which had also been the property in which Sean Ford had been staying in. It was at Josh Greathouse's residence that the police located a pair of jeans in the basement that appeared to have been partially burned. Heather Greathouse, the sister of Joshua Greathouse, had been present at the family's home when the search warrant had been executed, and she made an interesting disclosure to the authorities at the time. She revealed that Sean had told her on the night before the murders that he was going to, quote, hit a lick which she believed meant to break into a house and then rob it. Heather went on to explain that she had found a pair of bloody pants on the floor the next day and told her boyfriend to burn them. She also claims that Sean had brought back two rings and some money the day after the murders and that her aunt had thrown away one of the rings at the family dollar store. The authorities were able to locate the ring from the dumpster, which backed up Heather's testimony. 
The detectives turned their attention to the evidence at hand. An autopsy was conducted by Dr. Dorothy Dean, who was a deputy medical examiner for Summit County, on the remains of Jeff and Peg. This autopsy details that Jeff had died as a result of multiple blunt impacts to the head, being struck at least 14 times. Further, it showed Jeff had been stabbed three times, though none of these stabbing injuries had been life-threatening. Peg had also died from blunt impacts to the head, with at least 19 impacts, though Peg hadn't been stabbed like Jeff had been. Both Jeff and Peg's injuries were ruled to have been consistent with that of being hit by a sledgehammer. The DNA and forensic evidence further expanded the investigators' understanding of what exactly happened that night. A forensic scientist at BCI by the name of Martin Lewis determined that a small piece of plastic that had been found on the showboat's marital bed fit perfectly into the handle of the knife that had been recovered from the storm drain on Fried Street. Martin Lewis concluded that the piece of plastic found had been at one point a piece of the larger knife handle. A forensic scientist from the BCI went on to state that stains found on the sledgehammer, on Sean Ford's shoes, on the cloth and latex gloves found in the City View Avenue drain, and stains found on the knife and stocking cap found in the Fry Street drain all tested positive in a presumptive blood test. Further, a stain on the burned jeans also tested positive. DNA profiles taken from the stains on Sean's right shoe, the gloves found in the City View Avenue drain, the stocking cap, the knife blade and handle found in the Fried Street drain and on the burnt jeans were consistent with Jeffrey Schobert's DNA profile with an expected frequency of occurrence of that DNA profile being 1 in 103.3 sextillion unrelated individuals. Also on Sean's left shoe was located a DNA profile consistent of that of Peg Schobert's. DNA profile on the stocking cap and burnt jeans were consistent with contributions from Sean and two unknown individuals. And the DNA profile on the outside of a latex glove contained a major profile consistent with Sean. Though it must be noted that the forensic scientist determines that Jamal Vaughn could not be excluded as the major source of DNA obtained from inside the other latex glove. This all left the investigators with one pressing question. What the hell happened on the 2nd of April 2013? This is what the authorities believe happened, and what the prosecutors presented to the court when this case went to trial. In the early morning hours of the 2nd of April 2013, Sean and Jamal Vaughn travelled to the Schobert family home carrying a sledgehammer. The pair then broke into the property quietly through a bedroom window on the ground floor at the back of the house that was not visible from the street. Bear in mind that Chelsea Schober had still been in the hospital with her mother Peg, who had remained overnight with her. Once inside the Schobert family home, Sean Ford and Jamal Vaughn brutally murdered Jeffrey Schobert using the sledgehammer as he slept in his bed. It's unclear who exactly used the knife to stab Jeff, but according to testimony, it had been Jamal Vaughn. After murdering Jeff in cold blood, the pair decided to use Jeff's cell phone to impersonate Jeff in order to get Peg Schobert to return back home, Let's take a look at those text messages. Bear in mind that Peg's real name is Margaret, so that's what they are in those text messages. You still at hospital? Have you been up all night? Yeah. How Chelsea doing? What time are you coming home? Who is at the house? Just me. I know you called, but my phone not working right now. I don't know why. We have been up since four. She's crying because she can't eat cereal and wants to see Sean. Is you go let her see him? Her throat is hurting. She says she is 18 and can do what she wants. Is this Sean? I hate that asshole. What is going on? I'm about to go to bed. I've been up all night, but what time are you coming? Why were you up all night? I was watching TV and I was studying my case. Why do you want to know when I am coming? Because I'm probably go be sleep when you get here just asking. Good night, hun. I can't deal with lies anymore. What are you talking about? No more text messages were sent between Jeffrey and his wife, Peg. Despite Peg's suspicions as to who had been sending her those text messages, she felt safe enough to return home without alerting the police. The evidence shows that Sean Ford and Jamal Vaughn had been lying in wait in the family home for hours prior to Peg's arrival. The pair then attacked her with the sledgehammer when she walked into the marital bedroom, hitting her in the head at least 19 times. 
It's important to note that Sean had claimed that he had arrived at the Schober family home without a weapon and had claimed during his trial that his original plan had been to just steal from the Schoberts. Whatever the case, the courts found there to have been sufficient evidence for any rational trier of fact to find beyond reasonable doubt that after Sean had arrived at the Schoberts' home, he had decided to kill them. And further, it was concluded by the courts that there had been sufficient evidence to establish that Sean Ford had acted with prior calculation and design in killing Jeff and Peg. The state ultimately charged Sean Ford with five counts of aggravated murder. In count one, he was charged with the aggravated murder of Jeffrey Schoberts with prior calculation and design. Count two saw him charged with the aggravated murder of Jeffrey Schoberts while committing an aggravated robbery. In count three, Sean Ford was charged with the aggravated murder of Jeffrey or Margaret, aka Peg, while committing aggravated burglary. Count four and count five were identical, bar for the victim being Margaret or Peg Schobert. Now, it's important to note that these charges could potentially have seen Sean receive the death penalty. Each aggravated murder count contains three death penalty specifications, and if Sean were found to be guilty of both the aggravated murder counts and guilty of at least one or more of the three specifications listed on the charge sheets, he would be eligible for the death penalty. Those specifications were 1. Committing or attempting to commit aggravated robbery as the principal offender in the commission of the aggravated murder or, if not the principal offender, committing the aggravated murder with prior calculation and design. 2. Committing or attempting to commit aggravated burglary as the principal offender in the commission of the aggravated murder or, if not the principal offender, committing the aggravated murder with prior calculation and design. And 3. A course of conduct involving multiple murders. Counts 6 through 11 saw Sean Ford charged with aggravated robbery, aggravated burglary, grand theft of a motor vehicle, petty theft, and the felonious assault of Chelsea Showbird. Sean Ford was arraigned on these charges on the 24th of April 2013. Interestingly, at the arraignment, Sean Ford acknowledged receiving a copy of this indictment, but actually declined to enter a plea, with his defense counsel reserving the right to challenge the charges and potentially enter a plea of not guilty, by reason of insanity. As a result, the trial court entered a not guilty plea on Sean's behalf and a pretrial was set for the 30th of April 2013. Though this pretrial was delayed and the initial pretrial took place on the 7th of May 2013, and in the pretrial, the state's discovery obligations were extensively discussed. Though as the defense had yet to receive any discovery, Sean Ford did not waive his white. What? Sean Ford did not waive his right to a speedy trial, and his counsel indicated that until the discovery had been reviewed, issues regarding the trial and speedy trial waivers could not be addressed. Now, throughout the initial pretrial hearings, Sean Ford's competence and potential not guilty by insanity defense were discussed numerous times. And ultimately, the defense filed a request for a competency and sanity evaluation, and for a not guilty by reason of insanity plea. The court subsequently ordered Dr. Woods from the Psychodiagnostic Center to conduct the evaluations. After conducting these tests on the 28th of October 2013, a competence hearing was held which determines that Sean Ford was competent to stand trial. The trial against Sean Ford commenced on the 9th of October 2014 when opening statements were made in the court and it lasted about 11 days. On the 20th of October, closing arguments were given before the jury began their deliberations and later that same day, the jury returned their verdict. They found Sean Ford guilty on all counts within the indictment, though he was not found guilty of all the capital specifications. While the jury found Sean Ford guilty of the aggravated murder of Margaret Schobert, aka Peg, with prior calculation and design in count four, the jury found Sean Ford not guilty of the prior calculation and design of the death of Peg in count five. The trial court ruled that sentencing would proceed on counts two, four, and 11, with all other counts merging. On the 27th of October, the jury returned a verdict of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for count two involving the murder of Jeff Schobert. And for count four, which involved the murder of Margaret Schobert, aka Peg, they returned a verdict recommending the death sentence. This is where the case gets a bit deeper. The defense requested an Atkins hearing to take place, which effectively is a hearing to establish whether Sean Ford had any intellectual disability, as if he did, it would make him not eligible to receive the death penalty due to rulings in Atkins versus Virginia. 
In preparation for the Atkins hearing, three experts were brought in to establish whether or not Sean Ford had been intellectually disabled. These three experts were Dr. Kate Connell, who was a forensic psychologist and was the court's expert, Dr. James Karpowicz, who was a clinical psychologist and who was the defense's expert, and Dr. Sylvia Obradovich, who was a forensic psychologist and who was the state's expert. Let's first take a look at what the court's expert, Dr. Kate Connell, concluded. Dr. Kate Connell conducted a detailed evaluation of Sean Ford's school records. A main note that an evaluation conducted when Sean had been six years old stated that he didn't meet the criteria of intellectual disability. This childhood evaluation put Sean Ford's learning disabilities down to linguistic factors, finding that he had a specific learning disability and subsequently identified a speech or language impairment. Dr. Connell then reviewed Sean's scores in five separate IQ tests, the first being conducted in 2001 at the age of six or seven, for which he scored 78. The second being a score of 62 in 2003 at the age of 9, though Dr. Connell deemed this score to not be reliable due to the evaluator stating in the report that Sean had been extremely fidgety and distracted at the time of the test. The third being a score of 75 in 2006 at age 12, the fourth being a score of 64 in 2013 at the age of 18, and the fifth and final being a score of 80 in 2013 at the age of 19. Dr. Connell didn't conduct any additional IQ testing, stating, quote, available records provided three prior IQ test results, and even when considering measurement error and that one was an abbreviated measure, all were clearly above the range of scores found in individuals diagnosed with an intellectual disability. And as a result, under the DSM-5 and the AAIDD-11, Dr. Connell concluded that Sean Ford did not meet the diagnostic criteria for intellectual disability. The defense's expert, Dr. Karpowicz, concurred with the court's experts, concluding, quote, Based upon the available information, it is my opinion with reasonable scientific certainty that there is insufficient information to conclude that the defendant fulfills the criteria for intellectual disability. The state's expert, Dr. O. Bradovich, also agreed with these findings, stating, quote, These results are not indicative of significant deficits in adaptive functioning. On the 19th and 22nd of June 2015, the court conducted the Atkins hearing. On the 25th of June 2015, the court issued its ruling, reaffirming the charges against Sean and confirming the sentence hearing, which was set for the 29th of June 2015. At this sentence hearing, Sean Ford, for the murder of Jeffrey and Margaret Schobert, was sentenced to death. Sean Ford's defense team appealed this sentence, which ultimately ended up in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court analyzed every detail in the case before coming to their conclusion. Quote, Here, the trial court's findings were informed by the view of medical experts, all of whom carefully looked at both Ford's IQ scores and his adaptive functioning. Every expert opened that Ford did not have an intellectual disability. To remand this case in the face of such strong evidence is simply wrong as a matter of law. For that reason, I respectfully dissent. Sean Ford's accomplice, Jamal Vaughn, who had been barely 14 years old at the time of the double murder, fully cooperated with Akron police and had told them what had happened shortly after the murders. His mother actually took him to the downtown police station and he helped, quote, fill in the puzzle pieces for the investigators. Jamal Vaughn pled guilty to two counts of aggravated murder and one count each of aggravated robbery and aggravated burglary. The judge considered Jamal Vaughn's genuine remorse from the beginning, his minimal juvenile record, and his limited intellectual abilities when deciding his sentence. When Jamal was asked why he didn't call the police during the attacks or try to stop them, he told the court, quote, I felt like I was paralyzed. I didn't know what to do. I was stuck like I couldn't move. Jamal Vaughn was subsequently sentenced to 25 years to life on each murder count and five years for the remaining counts with the possibility of parole after 25 years. And that brings us to the end of this case. Do you think the sentences were harsh enough? It's still so unclear what the exact motive was besides Chelsea's parents, Jeffrey and Peg, forbidding Sean from seeing her in the hospital. If that truly was the motive, it just demonstrates the evil at play here. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video just like this one. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case. And this on the screen uh, here is what the algorithm thinks you will enjoy next.